Well, they probably have a, a link. They all came in at the last minute last week. Oh, we have one, three, see, four. Yeah, they were just oh, waiting. we have people. There are humans out there. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Wait, one, two, three, four. Oh, fabulous. 16. 17, we're going great. Actually, Lorraine. Yeah. I mean, actually, it'd be good to post a few links, you know, to the head journal and that during the chat. Yeah, it would actually. Yeah, that'd be cool. Why not? Why not? Advertise as much as you can, lads. So we have 37 people now. Yeah, and rising. So <clears throat> <clears throat> we'll wish. That's cool. So, okay. So, hi guys, I'm just typing in there to the chat feature. Um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're from and if you have a lovely sunny day like we have down here in Cork, we'd like to know. Of course, I sent that to that to all the panelists. <laughs> no, I didn't. Do, 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 do. I did. Silly clown. Okay. Hi, everyone. Feel free to chat um, to each other there. Uh, welcome or uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are and where you're from and what the weather's like and whether you're going to watch the toy show or not tonight. Um, and in the meantime, we'll um, start uh, get the get go here. I'm Carol. We have a different lineup today, and uh, not so many speaking as last week, but um, I'd say we probably will be pushed for time like last week as before. So we have still have my uh, right hand man there, Farad, and his beautiful French accent. And Hello, um, we might hear a little bit more of that as the day goes on. Then our first speaker for today will be Lucy Phelan. She's a teacher. Hi, everyone. At Hiya, Lucy, in Tremor Road. Then we have a duet with the bold Trevor Boland, Trevor Boland from Ahead and Lorraine Gallagher to keep him in some kind of control, maybe. <laughs> no, maybe. Um, Lucy's going to talk to you about communications and her experience of inclusion in UDL and all sorts of things. Uh, Trevor and Lorraine are going to um, ignore the fact that it's 28 sleeps to the first Santa and they're going to give you a whole pile of stuff, um, technologically speaking, about... Uh, that you can use in the classroom with your students. Then we have Sharon McCarthy, and we have another duet, Sharon McCarthy and Dr. Michaela Connell. So we have Sharon, who works with us and training our teachers and working with autistic learners, and that's what she's talking about today. And she does uh, some consultation work for us as well. And Dr. Michaela Connell, who is a psychologist with the Southley um uh, services here in Cork so for some of you who are familiar with those jobs there like our Trevor here in front of us um they um we have a kind of a northly southly dichotomy here as well and then finally you're stuck with me I'm doing the last presentation and mine is going to be on mental health but it's not a COVID presentation so um to start off we may or may not have a visit from oh we have liz moyne and there you see her her name she hasn't shown us her face yet today maybe she will maybe she won't she's going to work in the background for us um and help us with the chat and help us with the questions so our education officer may or may not pop in if he does he'll be saying a few words um, and if he doesn't well he might join us next week so i think it's over to you lucy Okay, thank you, Carol. Really. So I'm just going to share. Hi, my name is Lucy Phelan, and I'm from CSN Clash de Stefanie Fintramo Road. So I'm just going to share my screen here with you, hopefully successfully. And uh, what I have here is uh, just the stuff that I'll be going through today. Now, it all started way back about three years ago when we were looking at ways of getting students to engage. We always found that it was absolutely, students were fantastic once you could get people to engage, but getting engagement was difficult for some students. 
So um, I was coming from library and I'd just taken that over and I met with Carol and Carol was um, doing the UDL badge at the time. So she was coming to us with all kinds of good ideas and uh, ways that we kind of knew about, but she was putting a voice onto some mm -hmm. of the things we were doing already and bringing that one step further. Mm -hmm. And also then uh, Jacqueline Carney at the time, she's uh, vice principal now, but at the time she was working with mature students and bringing mature students back into education. So we had this fabulous idea between us that we'd have a study hub. And our study hub was aimed at, um, actually made notes, it was aimed at people who needed that little bit extra without going for one-to-one -one, uh, support. It was aimed at people who really needed to get a distinction to go on to UCC or CIT. So we started looking at uh, workshops. We started ways of about how we would kind of unwrap an assignment for somebody. So I'm just gonna show you some of the old workshop stuff that we were pure delighted with at the time, I must say to you. But we came up with these ideas like having an assignment plan for students because again it was just keeping keeping students track getting them to kind of keep track of what was needed to be done so we had things like if you had module component and the assignment name and the elements written down here and how many words they would use and the time and notes etc so we were pure delighted with that and we had things like time management presentations. I'm just going to show you one or two of those that you know, had all of these slides that we take people through. And we set up workshops. They were hugely successful for some of the students. They were really successful. Um, and oh yeah, the check sheet was fabulous altogether. Um, give that a little run there a student could come in and run through an assignment at the end of it and really find out had they done all of the steps from the beginning of an assignment right through to where were the marks contained within the assignment and they had their proofreading complete. And as I said, this worked really, really, really well for a lot of our students who, um, for a lot of our students who were uh, really, I suppose, there looking for the distinction and they responded very, very well to that. However, we did have a cohort of students and it was almost too much information um, in, in too many separate packages. So we started looking at ways of, um, we started looking at ways of maybe combining some of that and and of course, Carol coming with the UDL training was a great help at the time because we started looking at ways of putting that kind of information uh, into a kind of a more simplified document. So I'll just take you through this now as to what we had. Um, this is uh, one of the things that we came up with in terms of just how would you tell somebody very, very simply how to write an essay, what is the format, how many words should you be using, what kind of study time would that, um, would that entail. So for somebody who was um, maybe um, coming into the world of study from uh, maybe not from the Leaving Cert and for people who wouldn't have had a history uh, of study or breaking uh, assignments and assessments down, we came up with this and please open. And this is the really the simplest bones of writing an essay. And what we imagined was that the essay would have 800 words. And a lot of level five essays are in and around the 800 words. So we break that down into, so we break that down into um, who the author would be um, or the authors, and that we would break that down into what was in an essay, whether it was, uh, you know, and usually the essay was the introduction, the main body, the paragraphs, and uh, the conclusion at the end. So the simplest way for us to break that down was that your introduction would have apples, oranges, pears, bananas, and grapes. And each, if you had it in the introduction, 
you would have a paragraph on each thing and you wouldn't really have your fruit salad until the end. So what we started doing then was breaking down the word count so each student could, um, you know, could look at the amount of words that was needed per paragraph. And then also adding in the research time and the writing time associated with that paragraph. So the student had everything there in front of them and they could, uh, they had everything there in front of them. And it was a kind of a one-stop shop for them. The other thing that was very, very handy about looking at things in this way was when it came to actually uh, working with a student on this, when you would be making out your essays, you'd actually find out how much work you were asking the student to do because this essay would take a student three hours and 40 minutes going with a very, very limited um, amount of research and limited amount of writing. So that was quite a handy thing that we were uh, doing. Now, Denise, um, Denise Ryan came on board uh, last year and this year, and I have everybody's titles down here, and she became the Director of Teaching and Learning. So this year, what we started to do was kind of, and both Denise and myself are doing the UDL badge this year ourselves, which is of immense benefit and help to us in terms of um, how we're looking at things. And we started re-looking at old stuff, taking what was good out of that and kind of putting a new and more accessible um, format to it for students, especially in the time of COVID. So in terms of writing the essay, it just gave it a little bit of that. I'm just going to take you through a very easy essay structure. And first, we're going to look at all the elements of the essay. So there's the title of the essay up here, the author no, I who wrote the essay. It will have an introduction. So uh, it was actually Farad, who is absolutely fabulous, that introduced me to uh, screen, uh, screen crest, isn't it, Fred? Yes. I was able to use that. I know, Fred, I can't get rid of this now. Oh, I see it. Yeah. It's behind my, it's behind my little thing there. So starting to use different ways to get students engaged and to understand that, um, you know, that if a student, I have two or three visually impaired students this year, which, um, really made me think about doing this to nearly all of my um to nearly all of my stuff and i'm just going to take you in here so for everything that we've done uh in terms of that so looking even at the communication technology essay uh, having uh say a powerpoint presentation making it, uh, I suppose, visually more interesting than what we've seen already that I've shown you, and also giving the student the opportunity, if they were in class and yes, they were listening, but that we're giving them the package now to take away from class with them or from the study hub with them, where I do a little voice over here, um, you know, taking people through all of the, um, different aspects that we would have gone over through the day and this is very handy as well for common subjects because if a student comes um comes to me for study support i'm able to give them this to take away with them so as that again it will take them through the main points of of what we have uh, what we have covered and i would find say the working with the powerpoint presentations um Students have really found that very, very, very useful. What they have also found very useful was the fact, that, you know, when I'll just show you the communication technology essay and how that looks like, what that looks like in terms of what the student has given, is that where it is there is that it still is in a the template. There still are the 50 words there. The main paragraphs are made out for the students so that they have a starting point that they can start engaging with the material. Now, some students will go way beyond that and will go way over the 130 words. And But for other students who find it difficult to engage, 
they will um, they'll find they are finding it uh, very useful because they know what's enough. They know what kind of time it's going to take, and they also know that um, all of the um, needs and the requirement for the um, assignment has been covered by that. So um, that is pretty much, I'll just show you one more of those, because that is pretty much where we are at. We're trying to build a, um, putting a lot of say the PowerPoint presentations and the, and you'll see it up here, um, uh, the screencast, um, you know, reading, uh, doing the briefs, reading the briefs, having them available through screencast, having uh, maybe common modules and common approaches, like say the proofreading, having that available as a PowerPoint presentation uh, with a voiceover so those people can hear as well as see. I'll just play you a little. I, oh, I did this with voice only. Did you enable editing, Lucy? Oh, thank you so much. And now I'm going to take you through a little bit about proofreading. Make sure that your script is fully finished before you begin to proofread. If you change the body of your script, so it goes on like that. And it just means that if somebody has a difficulty with reading for whatever reason, um, there is um, a little help there for the person or, uh, you know, you can read it as well. So that is, have I forgotten anything, Carol? I don't think no. so. No, no, you're absolutely fine, my love. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. But that is um, pretty much me done. Thank you. Thanks, Mary and Lucy. And can I say in deference to what she said, I was beginning to get a swelled head there. When I went into Tremor Road, which would be nearly six years ago now, and we started about two years after that, we started the UDL badge and our Champions of Disability. Everything that we did, the study hub, Lucy became the librarian, and so it was turned into a study hub. Um, uh, Jacqueline was working as a mature students officer. Um, so what I did was only put a name or an architecture on stuff. Everything that was happening in the college was already there. Jacqueline was already doing her stuff. Lucy was already doing her stuff. The team of 14 people that we built up doing learning support in that library, that study hub, they were already doing it. It was just the UDL badge and the work that we did in that pilot scheme um, put an architecture on it and gave us a platform to, to talk about it and, and identify it for the students. And I think, Carol, what it did as well was that it, um, everybody was doing things, um, you know, but I think what happened was people joined together. Like if I wanted, you know, if it was, if I was looking for something, I'd say, oh, Denise will have that. And we were much more likely to go to other people and do an awful lot more sharing. Yeah. So, you know, I'd call on you and I'd be kind of like, Carol, can you look over that? Is that, you know, and there was a very much um, an overlapping of skills. And um, I think it was much easier, like the structure I think um, was very good for students. They could see the structure as well. It was much more evident. Yeah, you we know? started building, you know, that was one of the ideas. We started building up the idea of an access and inclusion team within the Fred Red College really and and really it was only was it last two years ago Lucy the CSN was voted for the Red College of the Year you know, two years ago some yeah. of that kind of stuff was was part of the reason for that um John somebody there in the chat has said will these slides be available Lucy gives everything that she owns and possesses to every human being she meets and I have loads more <laughs> that I didn't show you but because it would only be going over this like the same format but any work I do I'm absolutely perfectly happy to share that and send it over to Carol and she can send it on. And there's another question for you there Lucy from Angela O'Rourke. Uh, hi Lucy are you putting the template up in assignments in Teams? Do you use Teams or I presume you use Moodle isn't it? I use Moodle, I use Teams, um, Zoom. Zoom. 
badly, but I'm kind of getting there. Um, what are we doing, Carol? I put in, in my email address down here, um, and you email me if you want the material, and I'll send it on to you. Um, as we're going along, Farad and myself are going to send out the recordings of the sessions, etc. But if people like there were lots of people emailed looking for PowerPoints last week, if you want them sooner, um, just email me. So, and I make sure, Carol, when I'm sending them over to you, that I'll send them as Word documents so people can adapt them. That I won't send them as PDFs. Don't worry, I have Farad with me. <laughs> Okay, lads. Thanks a million, Lucy. Um, I don't think there are any other questions, lads, are there? I don't think no, so. I don't no, think so. Okay, so thanks a million. Um, now we have the bowels, Trevor and Lady Lorraine, um, to tell us all about technology and all the other things they're going to say. Hello, everybody. Hello. So great, uh, great uh, to see all here. Great. I mean, it's uh, it's a lovely bunch. And actually, Lucy, that was an amazing presentation. I have to say, I've got resource envy. Uh, that was uh, that's uh, that's a mighty piece of work to do. I love it. Um, just wondering, can you see my screen? Yes. Super. Great stuff. Okay. So, so we're yeah. So we're sort of going to reflect on technology experiences, and we're going to do a bit of a. Where are we now? What's been going on? Yeah, so um, basically I just put up this things to do list because I just thought in the rush of semester one and all the things that we've done and we're still in the process of doing, um, I really like the idea of just taking just a few minutes to just kind of reflect on uh, what we've done so far. So if the slide will move along. Okay. So I suppose we know who we are. This is me and Lorraine, and there's our contact details anyway. So when the slides are passed on to you, you know how to find us. Yeah. So we saw, we thought we'd ask about, I mean, we were singing that song, Feelings. I was trying to remember who sang that song, right? So we're going to ask the audience, it's going to be kind of an interact. some of this is going to be an interactive session. So we want to know, um, what did you feel before the new term? Were you excited? Were you nervous? Um, and then what did you feel during the term? And then what do you feel about next term? Because what we're going to do is we are going to share all this information with Carol and it's going to form a basis for planning for the future. So let's get started by getting you to go on to www.menti.com and input the code 85118721. So go to menti.com and insert the code 85118872. So you'll uh, need to have a mobile device. And Lorraine, I'm just wondering, could you put that in the chat or could someone put that code in the chat just so people yeah. can copy it yeah. as well as the www.menti.com as well. <clears throat> So as soon I'm as sorry, everyone's actually. logged in, then we'll be... It is she's up at the top of the screen there, Trevor. Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. Make just sure, in case yeah. someone prefers to copy it and paste it into their browser. Okay. So this is Menti. So uh, I'm guessing most people or all of you might have used menti.com at this stage. So you're aware that it's kind of a polling tool and where people can answer questions and it just like collates all those kind of answers into one place. And it's a great thing to use with the students, actually. It is. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So I'll just go to the first slide. So in case you have logged in, you should be able to see those three questions. So it's like a sliding um, uh, type of instruction here. So. Just on both sides, there's positive and negative. So were you feeling positive about the beginning of the new term? How did you feel during the term? So again, I'm sure there's lots of, you know, pros and cons to that. And then even the next term, I suppose we're hearing what the situation is gonna be like um, for term two. Um, so again, has term this semester, this term been a good way to prepare for the next one? Um, or does it just kind of raise 
more concerns or do you feel like you found a lot of solutions already for the next term? So again, there might be a kind of a few mixed responses to that. Yeah. Okay. So, so can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, um, so some people were sort of like slightly in the negative area for the, during the term. Um, and so feeling before the new term, they were a little bit more positive. So in the middle of the term, it went a bit like not so positive. So that's interesting to, to, um, to see because we'll unravel that more as we kind of move on. So it's just to see where people are at. I wonder why you were all positive before it. Then you got a bit, you know, a bit stressed out probably. And you're feeling more positive about the new term. So roll on Christmas, I say. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking people would probably feel a little bit maybe more positive because maybe they had built a couple of strategies out. You uh, know, yeah, that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to transfer. We'll unravel it anyway. We go to, so we will go on to the next slide, will we, Trevor? Yeah. Okay. So next slide. Sorry. Skip that. So, um, so the challenges of the new way of working, right? So what were the biggest challenges? Wi-Fi, laptops, teamwork, assessments, experience. The last one is covered. I can't see it by the camera. Um, so communication, support and engagement. Yeah, so so we're going to show you another Mentimeter. Um, so again, so do the same as the last time. Log into Mentimeter.com yep. and put the code in. So it's the same code. So, yeah. so it's 85111872. And let us see, rank the challenges, right? Rank them. So we'll see what was the most challenging thing and what was less challenging. So rank them for us. Now I know this will take a minute or two. So the first one being Wi-Fi, laptops, the next, the third one, teamwork, then on to assessments, then on to experience. So that, that could be your experience of IT, could be the student's experience of IT, communication with the students, with each other, support, where you're supported, where you're able to support the students and engagement. So we engage with the students, okay. with each other. Okay, so answers are coming in, which is great. It's kind of like the excitement of your vision. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> Seeing who's coming in. Why um, <laughs> So uh, I, because one of the things I was interested in was particularly the Wi-Fi and kind of laptop ownership. And the laptop, yeah. Because the digital kind of poverty was mentioned so much throughout the summer. Many, many times. And actually yeah. people with IT skills, that's coming up, up, up as the first one. A lot of people okay. did mention that they were a bit worried about their IT skills. So then... I'm guessing if Wi-Fi was one of the top issues, that maybe then Wi-Fi was a kind of prevailing issue throughout semester one. So yeah. I'm guessing would that continue then in semester two? We'll see. We've um, all had those crashes, Trevor. Yeah, <laughs> we sure have. Um, so and then with the experience and the IT skills, um, I actually find that what, what's amazing about the uh, the FPT sector I'm seeing is that because you're so agile, you, you're just doing webinars and you're being so proactive. Um, so it's amazing to see that, um, which is which is great. So, so I'm, I'm surprised to see um, ass um, assessments are in eighth place, which is good, because I was worried a bit, a bit worried about how people were going to assess the students. So that's very interesting. Okay. And, and the one I find interesting just at the end is the seventh one, so teamwork. So I wonder, have some educators kind of removed teamwork and maybe substituted for individual work because of the kind of the online nature of this year? So, and actually, I was going to say to people as well, feel free to put in comments about these, um, these challenges, please, because we'd like to know. And um, how, how you were managing. So Lorraine and uh, Trevor, I think Joanne, uh, Max Sweeney put her hands up there. So I'm going to allow her to talk just to see if she has a question. OK. Yeah, okay. no problem. Joanne. Sorry, Farid. I think I might have hit that by accident. Apologies. Oh. I was trying to open oh. the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's OK. So will we go on to the next one. That's very interesting. We'll go on to the next one. So what was positive about the situation? What was negative about the situation? And what was interesting or surprising? So we've used the sandwich method here. 
right? So what was positive and then what was negative or really challenging and then what was interesting or surprising, things that you didn't expect. So again, if we go into menti.com and use the code 8511. Yeah. yeah, so so it's the same code all the way throughout. So the, the next slide should just appear automatically when we move on to this slide. Yeah, so, so just to say as well, the same code in 85118872. And we'll see what oh, I'm dying to hear. It's, it's, find out about the surprises. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm really in the Christmas mood now of surprises, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, one of the things I'm wondering about, like, did people come up with new ways of, you know, getting students to work online together? I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. Yeah. As in the FET sector, they're so imaginative. So I'd say they did. And even, I, I think maybe some assessments might have changed as well. So I think there was one um, educator I know who um, engaged, got her students to create um, videos for an assignment. So here we are. Here's, so here's some popping in, right? So young people's IT skills are more limited than previously assumed. Yeah, we oh. all assume that the digital native is going to be really good on the computer. Positive was working from home with good tech. Negative bit was being alone. We felt that ourselves. Um, the colleges, uh, what was the surprise? The camera is actually in my way. The um, screen is in my way here. Go to okay. media class. But, so the college was extremely well prepared for the new circumstances. Students responded well, also that's good to hear. Okay. Um, positive was discovering and learning new technology tools. Very good. Okay. Um, so there was something about the skills being limited. Yeah. So yeah. um, online has its advantages, but bad for students that had the Wi-Fi issues and it caused frustration. Oh, okay. I totally get that. So very interesting. Um, ex the growth in the use of technology, yes. And of course, the, the positive thing of having more time with family, but couldn't manage my time appropriately. Um, and the young people were not willing to join the online lessons. Mm. Okay. Because I think there's been a lot of educators who have found it difficult to get students to turn their cameras on as well during kind of online sessions as well. That seems to be just throughout I did, I did an online session I delivered and I uh, presented at an online session during the week actually it was in the evening time and all the students were mature students and they nearly all of them had the cameras off so interesting yeah. and they were the mature students so it was interesting um, so enjoyed the zoom platform getting the students to talk online students engaged well on the chat and we had a very funny interesting conversation about chat didn't we Trevor yeah yeah, about some yeah. of the um, some staff, teaching staff having to turn the chat off. Yeah, just because students were chatting each other up um, throughout lectures. So so they just turned the chat off. Um, and actually, one lecturer was talking to me about how he found it surprising when he turned the chat off. He found behavior issues um, that he would typically see every year with students kind of dropped. Um, dramatically and as a and as a consequence of that the grades on average were higher um in previous year uh, compared to previous years That's so very interesting isn't yeah. it really interesting um and this one's got a really good surprise here a teenager that does not like school really engaged with the online learning wow. very interesting okay. yeah so there's so going to be a few students who probably take to the online more easily than others yeah yeah, so, that's very in, good. Yeah, okay. So we're going to give this to Carol anyway, so Carol's going to have all this information for everybody. So we go to the next one, Trevor. Perfect. Okay. So making an action plan. So what would assist you moving forward? And we've given you some um, some starting points, but of course you you probably have loads as well. So student engagement, peer groups, study groups, buddy systems, one-to-one -one connecting with the student. So do you meet with them one-to-one? -one? That's what we mean, that whole kind of thing about relationship building. And then synchronous versus asynchronous um, teaching, video making options, et cetera. So what would um, help you moving forward, making an action plan? Again, go to mentor.com and you can write in a few sentences around what would help you making the action plan, what things you could be doing. So that should be available now on your devices. 
So in terms of that kind of action plan, there may be kind of strategies that you've come across or um, strategies that you've heard other educators using as well that you kind of want to experiment with or um, apply for next semester. Um, so like that, you know, would teamwork, if you shied away from your students doing teamwork in semester one, would that change now for the, for, you know, January onwards? Would you engage in that more? Um, would you be interested in creating different communities of practice? together maybe there's groups of you who have identified kind of opportunities to develop a number of skills um, and even maybe identify kind of a suite of online workshops you know to help address those um, like if IT kind of skills were, were something that you identified as, as something to draw on. Um, so, yeah, so well, the first one sorry Travis popped up here is um, strategies to improve engagement yes for the students and for each other I presume that mm. is and oh, actually have students good. come up with ideas. Yeah, yeah they maybe may students have, have yeah. submitted ideas as well. So I know some students have set up things like WhatsApp groups and stuff as well and um, to, to help engage with each other. Okay. So, I like the um, one about using Flipgrid and Wakeless. They seem to be getting very popular, actually. Yeah. yeah. Really like and um, gonna break, somebody's going to break down these times into smaller bite-sized chunks. So I'll have a range of... Um, loan and working team exercises along with individual skills okay. demonstrations are really good. Use of laptops from uh, mobile trolley in classrooms. Um, short Zoom followed by a task for students and then checking back at a later time to check in with them. That's a really good yeah, strategy. That is good. So again, communities of practice, I mean, we know from the inclusion network that um, you're so good at doing that down, down in Cork. And then have students kind of created their own study groups, I wonder. Yeah, or, I yeah wonder. because I'd be wondering, like, if they did kind of create online groups with each other, would they have met up, discussed what the lecturer or the educator had spoken about, you know, and help each other then through online study groups? Because that is part of the college experience when you are when you are actually in college, is that you meet up. So I wonder how they've been doing that. Yeah, because actually um, myself and the range, remember we were talking to a counsellor one of the counsellors there um, from TU Dublin, and he mentioned kind of loneliness was an issue with like students um, this year. So, so he was actually hoping maybe lecturers would kind of do more kind of group work or kind of encourage students to create their own kind of online study sessions. And if not, would the would the tutors actually do that? So, so make it part of the course that they have to actually set up a study group. You know, so sort of make it mandatory to 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 kind of push them along a bit. Okay. or semi-mandatory. Okay. Um, we had so, one of the UDL people last week, one of our teachers presenting, saying, um, Niamh O'Keefe said that one of the things she used was the peer groups that she had for your UDL badge. So oh, very good. Back. Very that's good. That's what she took from it, was having her students work in peer groups um, was magic. And it's wow. great for us to get that feedback. So thanks, Carol. That's yeah. great. I love the way someone's mentioned Jilly Salmon as an approach. I have to say I'm a big fan of Jilly Salmon. So she's an amazing online educator. And she, again, kind of like Lucy, makes all her materials available um, to people. So she's been prolific for years about advocating teaching online. So and she's got a very active Twitter account. And I think she even does a newsletter um, to online educators as well. So she's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, and somebody said it's hard um, with blended learning as some classes in colleges and others in Zoom land, but students have helped with organising time so they can get time to move in um, the odd day. Zoom is good as you can get them to work on assignments. Yeah, that's very right. good. Quiz online practice test for students. Oh, that's a great idea. And actually Office 365 has a brilliant um, quiz form as well. So if you go to forums in Office 365, there's a specific quiz one and um, you can appoint specific a number of points per question. Um, so it's brilliant for, for online quizzes. Um, and I've tried it out myself. You can add images and even put alt text on the images as well. So Very you can good. make them really accessible. Very good. Um, there is a need though for training on more on different platforms. So yeah, a lot of people would be saying that. Okay. But this might be a good time then to kind of talk to whoever are your trainers to draw up a plan then for January. You know, about that kind of professional thing, yeah. development. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I like the way someone's tried different forms of Kahoot, online recording, skills demos. That's brilliant. Yeah. Very good. And somebody saying that in the chat that Kahoot is good for um, quizzes too. Um, somebody had to break the classes into two 
and assi um, assigned example patients with a range of problems to one person. That's a, that's a good idea, breaking them up. Yeah, that's brilliant. Breaking up the groups. So we move on, Trevor. Yeah. Okay. I think so. so this is our shameless self-advertising. Self yes. <laughs> so just to say that I am also, you know, in a head, it's a tiny organization. And uh, so we all sort of like multi, multitask in a head. So I'm also the sub editor of the Ahead Journal. And this is just a shameless plug because I would like to get some more stuff from the FET sector. So I'm always on the hunt for articles. Now, the next submission date is the 12th um, of December. For this upcoming journal but please do if you're if you have something that's nearly ready to go please fire it along to me if not i'm always on the hunt so don't forget that we do have a journal for you to showcase um really good practice that you're doing so just to plug that and actually my shameless plug is we have just released today a new resource in a hedge yay, yay! so it's only 50 web pages long you'll be delighted to hear Yes, 50 web pages. You were kind of wondering what you're going to do over Christmas in January. Well, now you've got a plan. So you go to the AHEAD website, you look for AT Hive, and it's um, basically a resource of, uh, I think currently it's got 50 different types of assistive uh, technologies up there, um, all to support individuals, um, like as in students, um, help them, um, I mean, develop their own kind of learning strategies you know, and how to kind of use tools, say in Office 365 or Google or different websites um, to use kind of dictation tools so they can write with their voice or using read aloud tools where they can have information read back to them, even converting text into MP3. Oh my God, it's so out there. So um, if you want to be inspired in many different ways and go back uh, to your classrooms in January and basically and tell your students to, you know, even visit AT Hive themselves. They might get ways to, you know, develop their own independent learning as well uh, through using uh, these different technologies. So, and then even if you or your students are interested, um, there's a, a web page called AT Hive uh, Write Up um, within that section, and uh, we're encouraging people from all different sections, like FET, higher ed, from uh, employers to submit assistive technology write-ups. So if you're using a technology um, and you want to share uh, about like your experience with the te te that technology and even give like a, a description about maybe how to use it, um, just feel free to fill up this template. It makes it really easy about how to submit that idea. And then we can put it on the website and then share it with the public. So, so already we've had a number of submissions. And so we accredit people as well when they've done that. So I think, I think that's our shameless plugging done. Yay. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. There's a few comments here. Um, the AT Hive looks brilliant, Trevor. Yay. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I've been breaking out in sweats all week, just trying to get everything done. Yeah. So I put in the link there as well. Um, for the AT Hive. So again, students, we're asking students to kind of look at it. We're inviting people like yourselves. So again, I suppose the great thing about assistive technology is that it encourages individuals to support themselves. So even each web page has instructions and tips about each assistive technology, and many of them are free as well. And remember as well, it's not only about in college, it's also about thinking about actually when I leave college, so how does my technology go with me, travel with me to the world of work? So for students to use the time in college to, to find out actually what works for them and to be kind of tech confident so that when they do move into the world of work, that it's, that it's a seamless process. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. Okay, brilliant. Well, I think we're done. Are we under time? Or over You're time. actually under time, believe it or not. For all that the a... conversations we for... had <laughs> of the last two weeks, you are under time. That must be a first. That is definitely <laughs> Ever. a first. Okay. Well, that's brilliant. I'm so delighted. And, and the timing of your ahead hive is just absolutely fabulous. Because I was about to, just before you said it, I was about to say, and that's, can you tell the people here watching, please, of all the resources that you have in a head 
because certainly I've been offered all of them for our own systems here once I credit ahead with them, we'll say. Um, but there's some fabulous stuff up there, you know, absolutely. Even before just, today. Yeah, and just to say as well, there was a few things like, you know, putting subtitles onto uh, PowerPoints and putting sound on and stuff. Remember, we've already done, myself and Trevor did those webinars over the summer. So please feel free to go and check out those webinars again. And the great thing about having it recorded is as a resource is that you can go back again and again and have a look and see, oh yeah, how did they do that? You know, and practice it yourself. So please feel free to go in and use our resources and give us your feedback, you know, so we can improve things over time mm -hmm. as well. Because actually we will be coming up with a, a members se a webinar series for semester two. Um, so any ideas, yeah, will help us actually figure out what what people like yourselves want from this members webinar series. Yeah. And then someone's looking for my email. So I'll just oh. throw it in there. I want to come after you, Lorraine. <laughs> after me. <laughs> I knew it would happen. I just knew it would happen. Yeah, so that's like... It was only a matter of time. On your talk before we started, Trevor. Pardon? Oh. <laughs> on your talk before we started. That's true. We did That's much true. better this week. We didn't have the practice session on view to everyone. We learned. So yeah. it's and um, it's been great. I'm delighted that everybody's here today, and I hope that um, you know, that's been useful today. And please do feel free to contact us again. You know, that's what we're here for. And as I always say, no question is stupid. No yeah. question. There's no such thing as a silly question. Anything, you know, contact us. We're always, we're always available. I did some training a good few years ago for NIPT. It's now dreaded stuff. And there was this guy from a behavioral unit who spoke to us and he was electric. He was wow. just on fire the whole time. But, and one of the first things he did with us was started just training to use our breath because as teachers, we talk all the time and we wreck our throat and our voice box and everything else. Um, but one of the things, one of his slogans that he said, and I've never forgotten it, is asking, asking for help is a sign of strength. Um, yeah. and, and I had never thought of it that way before he actually said it, but, but it actually is, you know. Yeah, so okay. and that's, what we, that's what we're here for, so. Well, thank you kindly to both of you for that, for showing us exactly how, well, you know, the different things that we can do with Mentimeter um, and, uh, and for telling us about your Ahead Hive. Um, so next now we have Sharon McCarthy, as I say, she has worked with us on training our teachers during COVID. We had some online training there on how to work with autistic learners. And we no doubt we're going to have more by the looks and sounds of things. She's also doing some consultation work with us in some of the centers. Um, and she was recommended to me by Miholo Mohuna. So some of you in Cork might know of him. He runs the Cork Autism Conference. Um, and with her, she's brought Dr. Michaela Connolly who is in South Lee and um, Sharon is going to talk to us about autistic learners and everything, well, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, a tiny fraction of what she knows about autistic learners. Um, and Michaela is going to talk to us about anxiety um, and anxiety for everybody. So I'll be quiet now and let them at it. So, hi guys, I'm going to start first. So bear with me while I share my screen. Um, and we will get going straight away and hopefully we will we'll go without uh, we'll go, set, start off without a hitch because I've got very big shoes to follow there following Trevor and uh, following Trevor's presentation. So I'm going to get started slideshow and hopefully now all will go OK. And here we go. So I'm going to make myself small now and just get going. So guys, I suppose, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to speak to you very, very briefly about supporting autistic learners. So just to say first and foremost, that my name is Sharon McCarthy. I am the founding director of the Autism Journeys Consultancy and Training Service. I'm also host to a show called Autism Journeys Radio Show and Podcasts, and I'm also a parent in an autism and additional needs household for more than 20 years. So, and, and I I'm really, really honoured to introduce my colleague, Michaela Connolly as well. 
Hi, folks. It's um, great for me to be here today. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm Michaela Connolly. I'm an education and child psychologist, and I work in the South Lee, as you said, Carol, with um, children and young people with autism. So looking forward to talking to you um, about anxiety today. Thank you. So guys, I'm going to get started to it um, straight away. As I say, it's going to be a very, very brief overview. Um, there's not enough time at all in 12 or 15 minutes to share. Um, so I suppose I'm just going to very briefly touch on ways in which to best support autistic learning needs. And I hope that you guys will have one or two ideas for some strategies that you might be able to use moving forward. So... Um, so first and foremost, what is autism? I don't have time to explain it, obviously, but I suppose it's really important that we acknowledge autistic rhetoric. So take note of what autistic adults are telling us. And it, they state very clearly that autistic individuals tend to think and learn very differently from non-autistic people, that autistic people tend to process information quite differently as well from non-autistic people, and that autistic individuals are very impacted at times by non-conducive environments. Now, however, it is it is important to note that autistic individuals absolutely thrive in predictability and in structure and that they also offer very unique perspectives to any conversation or to any group work or to any class that we might be teaching. Um, I suppose in keeping, in keeping with everybody else's plug, so to say, um, if anybody does want to learn a little bit more about autism, Autism Journeys Radio Show is um, a very eclectic podcast that has a number of different voices contributing to the conversation. So this is the uh, the link to the podcast that can be listened to on SoundCloud. It's a fantastic free resource with almost 90 podcasts to date, should anybody want to check it out. So I suppose when we think about autism, ordinarily, uh, we know that individuals have to present with a pervasive and ongoing difficulty in communication and in interaction in order to acquire an autism diagnosis. So it makes sense that we look at ways in which to support an autistic learner in this way. So first and foremost, very first thing that we need to know is that it is really important that we never insist uh, upon the student making eye contact with us, nor do we ever place an expectation for it full stop. The reason being that autistic adults would state very clearly that this kind of a social demand can be very anxiety inducing. And it can also cause the autistic person to feel quite nauseous or indeed to process this, this uh, eye contact as quite painful a sensation. So for that reason, we never do. I suppose the other reason is that um, there is an autistic advocate, uh, well, there was rather an autistic advocate called Donna Williams, who would state very clearly that in order to hear you, she was not able to look at you. If she had to look at you, she would not be able to take in the language that you were saying. And according to many of the autistic individuals that I would have met across the years, they would all state the same, that in order for them to be able to hear and process what you're saying, they can't look at you properly. And um, we should be allowing for processing speeds. So again, autistic individuals do find it more difficult at times to process auditory or uh, verbal uh, information and instruction by comparison to huge strengths in visual processing styles. So because an individual may present with difficulty around that processing of that kind of information, we need to make sure that we are allowing time, not only for the person to hear what we say, but to process it, interpret it, and output a response based upon what we've just said. We should be using clear and explicit instruction and making sure that we offer these instructions using literal and concrete language. The reason being that autistic individuals can oftentimes be very literal in their thinking. And when you say something, they will take, uh, take it exactly as what you have said. So inference-based language doesn't uh, support autistic learning. We should be stating, we should be saying what we mean and meaning what we say. This in turn will also support um, an individual around that difficulty with nonverbal communications. The reality is, is that any communication that we engage with um, includes 93% of it is nonverbal communication. Only 7% of it is verbal or what we say. So 
the reality is, is that the autistic learner in front of you is trying to oftentimes figure out what to do based upon those words that you're saying and not, they, they may not pick up on the nonverbal communications, your gestures, your noddings, your facial expressions and so on. So we need to be setting the student up for success ultimately. And one way in which to do so is to use very clear, explicit language. We should also be ensuring that we structure up any group work and we should let the autistic person know of any expectation for that group work. As I've said, autistic individuals do thrive in predictability. So knowing what's going to happen and knowing what the expectation is. When we structure up group work and when we state that there may be three roles, for example, that one person is going to take notes, one person is going to speak on behalf of the group and one person is going to be on the computer researching. When we structure a group activity up like that, we set the student up for success. Some students may need for you to, to add an additional layer and allocate those roles to individuals. So you might have a group of 18 people and say all the ones are the researchers, all the twos are the speakers and all the threes are the note takers. Um, and by doing so, again, it's a great, great way in which to set the student up for success. We should also be providing opportunity to use special interests. So this is a great, great motivator for many autistic uh, students to engage with course curriculum and stuff. I know that, um, that one strategy that works quite well is to ask a student to, to perhaps write up a project focusing on their special interest. So if you've got somebody who's very interested in history, but most particularly Roman history, for example, if you encourage the student to, to, to create a project where they've got to create a PowerPoint, they've got to research it, they've got to uh, figure out how they're going to present this to their classmates, you're setting them up for success. Not only are you allowing for them to engage with their preferred topic, but you're also teaching them those, those necessary skills that we need for them to learn in order for them to progress academically. When we think then about sensory processing and emotional support, so we know that 95% approximately of autistic individuals present with differences in sensory processing. That would mean that some people present with challenges or some people present with, um, with a, a hypo sensitive system. That means that they need a huge amount of sensory information in order to uh, register it and to respond accordingly. Other individuals oftentimes will perceive some sensations as exceptionally painful and very minute sensations. So they don't need a lot of information. They only need very slight sensations in order to feel that sensation at all. So I suppose when we think about that kind of differentiated sensory processing profile, we need to make sure that our autistic students are set up for success so that they can, they can sit, they can access um, the curriculum and that there is an equity to their participation in and benefit from their education. One way that we can do this is we can provide, we can ensure that the student has access to unlimited movements in and out of class. When we allow for the student to be able to move in and out of class um, as they need to, we ensure that they access different regulatory type strategies so that they can make sure that their energy levels and that their bodies are in a place where that energy matches the demands that are being placed upon them. Um, I suppose the other thing to say about this is that when a student is able to move in and out of class, we are encouraging independence and we are respecting autonomy. So it's really important that we do that. The next thing that I think is, is exceptionally important is that we ensure that students have access to whatever necessary sensory tools they need to in order to remain in class and to learn. I suppose when I think about sensory tools, um, I oftentimes meet young people who like to wear sunglasses, for example, even in a classroom, because that fluorescent lighting above or overhead in some rooms is too overwhelming for the student student to be able to cope with. So they need to wear sunglasses in order to block out that visual information. Some individuals talk about needing to wear headphones to filter out any background noise, chewing gum and peaked cap and so on. I suppose the reason I mentioned these is that ordinarily we as teachers believe that these aren't appropriate to wear in class and to use in class. However, I think we really need to flip the narrative and flip our thinking and realise that these can be the difference between an autistic student acting 
accessing a curriculum and accessing an education and not being able to access it at all. So if you have a student who talks about needing to wear headphones, um, it's really important that we understand that this is in order to be, they, they, they're wearing them in order to be able to filter out background noise so that they can focus on the lesson at plan. I suppose the other thing that we need to be doing for our students is we need to be identifying a safe person and a safe space. When we identify safe people for the autistic student to go to, we proactively set them up around anxiety management and we let them know how they can manage their anxieties independently. When we, when we identify safe spaces, we again ensure that the student has somewhere to go when they are beginning to feel overwhelmed, not just in their sensory systems, but when they're beginning to feel very, very anxious. Because the reality is, is that depending upon whatever study or research paper that you look at, any number up to 84%, depending on which one, uh, would state that autistic individuals present at any stage or another um, with levels of pervasive and ongoing anxiety. So we need to be supporting that anxiety as well. Now, with regards to exams, then I know that um, it, it, coming up to this time of the year now, it can be very, very difficult for autistic students. What we need to be doing is we need to be looking at what kind of accommodations the student previously accessed in their junior certs and their leaving certs. So if they accessed a reader or a scribe or assistive technology or an individualized space, we need to be matching that. We need to be providing those same accommodations again. Additionally, though, we're lucky in that we are third level, third level teachers because we were not uh, so tied to having to sit 10 class subject uh, tests in two days. And um, sometimes it works very well to allow an autistic student to complete a test every day rather than have two or three tests on one day. When we do that, we ensure that the student actually has time to decompress, to manage any anxieties felt, to process what has happened and to prepare for the next exam again. The other thing that we can be doing as adult ed teachers is we can make sure to offer any exam questions and exam papers in plain English format. Remember that autistic individuals oftentimes have difficult with inference based language. This doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's verbally or in text, it's still inference based. So it makes sense that instead of saying, well, Sharon and Michaela, Sharon has three apples and Michaela has four apples. How many apples do they have? It makes sense that we instead say four plus three equals. It's the same question we're just setting up the student for success when we consider the language that we use and make it very concrete and explicit instead the other thing i suppose to say with regards to exams is that we should never ever consider um using pop uh, quizzes these kind of pop-up uh, exams in class surprise tests the reason being that first and foremost we're not going to uh, learn about how, uh, or rather, the student is not going to be able to showcase their level of knowledge in this because their anxiety levels are going to increase immediately. But second of all, these kinds of pop quizzes that are exceptionally unpredictable and that change the environment and make it uh, feel like a very unsafe environment can potentially um, cause anxiety levels to be so great that the student may not be able to access a curriculum in that class for the rest of the semester or for the rest of the term or for the rest of the year indeed because the student may, be, may enter that class every single time and feel anxious that perhaps there's going to be another pop quiz sprung on us again and only be able to focus on that. So it's a good idea not to um, ever use pop quizzes. And I suppose the other things then to say, is there, there are other, there's so many different support strategies that we can use for autistic learners. I suppose it's really important that we offer visual visualized information. When information is visual in nature, we set the student up for success because we are working, to, we're working using one of the autistic individual strengths. Uh, we can absolutely organize and structure up our classes by writing down every day that we're go first we're going to do this, next we're going to do this, and finally we're going to do this up on the whiteboard in the classroom every day. If we're working online, we can put it on our first one or two slides to indicate to the student what the class expectation is going to be for that class. 
that way we again create a level of predictability that allows the student to lower anxiety levels to lessen their sensory processing dysregulations as a result and to access their education color coding books is a really good idea in that if we color code we'd say english books for example place a yellow strip across the edge of every english book binding you place a, a yellow strip across the English textbook, across the English workbook, across any copy books or whatever. When you have a slide pertaining to English, you color code the top strip of it in yellow to indicate to the student. With regards to those books, if you place them in a zippy folder, you can color code that folder along the edges again with the same strip of yellow paper. By doing so, we set the student up for success because again, we're adding an additional visual layer of support to their organizational, uh, their, their organization of their belongings. Many autistic individuals present with executive functioning difficulties that impact upon organizational skills. So this is a great way in which to support that organization for autistic students. We should be offering electronic notes and notes before class wherever possible. When we do so, we allow the student time to read over the notes and to take on board some of the information so that when they're sitting in class, all they have to do is try and focus on what the teacher is saying and process the information accordingly. It sets the student up again for success. I suppose the other thing then, the, 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 the other important thing that we need to be doing is we need to be regularly checking in with the student. Autism is essentially um, an ongoing difficulty with the, the, that in, inherent difficulty around social instinct. And we, by us checking in with the student rather than waiting for the student to approach us, we remove a level of social demand that is placed upon the student. And again, we set the student up for success with regards to engaging with us and with regard to asking questions and so on. So I suppose ultimately our goal always where an autistic student is concerned is to consider equity of access and benefit to education. These are some I of the strategies. Nothing but time. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, I'm literally finished. That was my final sentence. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. If anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask us at the end. And I'm delighted to, int to introduce my uh, colleague and associate, Michaela Connolly now. Thanks, guys. So I am very conscious of time as well. So I know that we're, you know, not going to have a huge amount of time. This is going to be a really brief overview of anxiety. Um, I don't know if I'm able to share the screen, but Sharon, you might pop onto the next yeah. slide for me. I'm actually, yeah. no, you share it away now, Michaela. I've yeah, come out great. of it. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, try again. Okay. Okay, it's just going back there. So I'll fly along. Oh no, thank you. This so I'm just going to talk a little bit about anxiety. I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms and causes and some of the strategies that we can use to help. So anxiety is what we all know, what we say when somebody worries a lot. It's a normal human emotion. It comes from one of our primary emotions, a survival emotion, fear. Everyone experiences it from time to time, always for good reason, but sometimes it is significant and it's overwhelming. And when we are anxious, there are things we can do to help. At milder levels, we can do things to help ourselves maybe, or other people can help us a little bit, but when it gets more severe, it's really good to get the help from other people. It can be too much for us to, to bear on our own. So we go just into that fear and why anxiety, why fear responses. One of the great people to kind of look up on this is um, Stephen Porges. And he came up with this polyvagal theory, which relates to our vagus nerve, a big old nerve that connects our brain, different organs in our body, and is involved in that kind of fear response and our survival responses. So I think it's very interesting to look at the different kinds of responses that we can have, what we might call the five Fs. And even for myself, going through all this and learning about this, I became aware of how I respond in different situations. So you could have different responses depending on the situation you're in, and you can have different kinds of levels of responses. So at some level, fight is about fighting your corner. 
it could mean that you're being very angry or in a milder way, it could mean you're a bit defensive about things. For flight, it's that experience where we really feel like running away. We want to escape. We want to avoid whatever it is that is frightening us. Fawn is this um, response we have where we will appease, we will please, we will do whatever is necessary for us to feel safe. And freezing is when things become quite heightened, when anxiety and fear become quite heightened, you go into this kind of free state, you almost become immobilized, shut down, becoming quiet. So sometimes we don't see anxiety in people because they have this internalized response. They have a kind of a shutdown and we see it a lot with our young people with autism or autistic young people who will shut down. So you'll see some people who will fight, but some who will internalize it and shut down. And faint then, for some people, is that feeling weak and dizzy um, and almost like a little bit of a shutdown as well. And some people feel faint during panic attacks, for example. These responses are biological. They are often automatic. They happen. Our bodies are responsible for them. Our bodies are very wise and they're trying to keep us safe in different situations. So a perceived threat causes this instant response and what we might call our downstairs brain takes over. So um, Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson talk about the upstairs brain, which is your thinking brain, your language, communication and your downstairs brain which is your limbic system the emotional brain and then that back brain brain stem that more primitive part of your brain when we're really afraid our downstairs brain takes over for good reason it kind of disconnects from your thinking brain so your thinking strategies don't really work your body goes into that fear response energy goes straight into your body really quickly and it mobilizes for different things to happen and that can um, we can think about the symptoms of anxiety, which I'll look at in a minute. Your breathing quickens, your heart speeds up, digestion slows down, and your certain senses become kind of distorted. They become maybe heightened or some senses become, you know, kind of lowered. So a survival response makes it more likely that you survive extreme threats and your body is just trying to keep you safe. So if a car is coming while you're crossing the road, your body will take out that situation a lot faster than your brain which will be kind of trying to think well now that's coming at this kind of a speed it's and and you know the trajectory and everything else your body goes get out of there and you're kind of more likely to be saved so as i said that response is generally automatic we can certainly modulate some of these with thinking strategies and we can look at different um, kinds of therapies that help us to use strategies to help us with our, our anxiety. But when it gets to a certain level, you're in your body. And certainly in cases where people have been traumatized, um, post-traumatic stress, their bodies bring them into this state and there's very little their minds can do about it. And we really feel that anxiety is not is a helpful response to situations in, for example, panic attacks, they can happen triggered by certain things but they can also happen for no apparent reason and you'd wonder well what's the wisdom of my body when I'm having a panic attack in a shopping center so we look at anxiety as affecting us in different ways it affects our thoughts it affects our feelings and it affects our bodies and we can look at strategies that help for these different things our thoughts our feelings and our bodies and the symptoms of anxiety while we might think it's a big ball of worry we have symptoms in our thoughts, in our feelings, in our body. So you can have that worries, the catastrophic thinking, mental fog, um, difficulty concentrating. And you might notice this in the last while um, with all our anxiety levels raised at the moment. You can have memory problems. So you wonder, am I going mad? I thought I left the keys there. Where did I go? Are you walking through a room and you don't know why you went in there? Low mood can very often occur with anxiety because it's such a heavy burden, sadness, um, feeling of worry and fear, anger. Sometimes people are very irritable and angry when they're anxious and they don't realize that that's what the underlying thing is and avoiding things. And the problem with avoiding things that um, closes down our world a little bit, but also we can avoid some of the things that are actually good for us, good for our well-being, and maintain us. So we might want to go out, we might want to go for a walk, we might feel we have the energy for doing anything. And that can kind of cut off those those things that, that keep us well and maintain us. So that can happen. We just have very low energy sometimes. So the kind of symptoms which are coming from that fear response really, things like sweating more, feeling tension in your body, having muscle pain, having digestive problems because 
that blood isn't going to the gut. The gut is kind of shut down a little bit when we're very anxious. So we can, we can we're we not in that rest and digest. We're in the, you know, fight or flight. So that, that can occur with anxiety. Our breathing can get quicker. And sometimes people wake in the middle of the night gasping for breath. And um, that can often be anxiety. Having a dry mouth, maybe your body shaking, having sleep problems and increasing your heart rate and increase in urination and sometimes people don't actually know they're anxious till they've been to their GP with what they thought was a medical complaint medical complaint was ruled out and they actually discovered no actually I think it's anxiety or it's it's panic so that can be um, a surprise to people now I would always say if you have these kind of symptoms no harm getting them checked out medically anyway but it could be that it's anxiety if there's no other explanation. So why do we have anxiety? There's so many different reasons, so many different people, there's different levels of it, but it's often things like burnout. If you've been going for too long, too hard, you can start to feel very anxious because you're burnt out, your energy resources are gone. Illness naturally, that illness, our own illness or somebody else's illness can cause a lot of anxiety. Uncertainty is a huge driver as well. Not knowing what's happening next, not knowing when things are going to happen. Um, maybe your, your job is at risk or something like this. Genetics, sometimes there can be, it can run and it's about looking at how can we let go of those kind of things. Tiredness, environmental and sensory issues, like you were saying, Sharon, that can be huge for some people. Um, they can feel very unsafe in a certain environment. People with sensory sensitivities can have an awful lot of anxiety because of that. Trauma and bullying, social and financial stresses, and difficulty with regulation. Some of us don't really know sometimes what's happening in our bodies, what a certain feeling is. So we mightn't have that body awareness that can tell us this is just anxiety, this is just worry, it's, it's you know, that's all it is. Knowing what it is can contain it a little bit. Um, I suppose when it gets to a severe level, uh, we, we call it a disorder because it, it really does impact um, to a great degree on people's living. So we can have generalized anxiety disorder, which is that, irritability, that worry, that I think of the classic one would be afraid of um, something, or sorry, that's a phobia. Panic disorder is like that something triggers it, so it could be dogs, or it could be that you don't know why, but you suddenly have a panic attack for no reason. Agoraphobia is a fear of open space or being out in places with people around. Um, those phobias and fears that we all know about whether it's dogs or spiders, social anxiety disorder, that fear of being judged by other people um, and, and how we judge ourselves. And post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Something has happened and you've, you've the trauma and stress of that. That they're very quick summaries. So from there's great information on the HSE website. They have information on anxiety and also the NHS have good information on post-traumatic stress disorder. And I suppose I would think that a lot of people go on for a long time with these difficulties and a lot of life you're living can be kind of um, shrunk um, by these. There are people who can help. There are things that can help. So I'd always say to somebody, just reach out and thinking of that polyvagal theory, one of the greatest calming things that we can do is to socially engage with other people that's other people can really help us to regulate ourselves so whether it's your friends your family or maybe a professional that you kind of reach out and get some help from someone else if you have these issues Sorry, Michaela, so, your, your, charges my battery, what drains my battery? So, your internet is going a, a little yeah. bit, sometimes hard to hear you. If I could advise you, because it's very interesting what you're saying, would you mind just maybe turning off your video? So am I, not I'm freezing, am I? Yes, and just have the microphone on. Sure, sure. Sure. So... Trying to do that now. Okay, sorry about that. 
Not at all. Thanks for telling me. Sorry if I'm racing as well. But anyway, um, so pacing ourselves, noticing our regulation and energy levels, as I said, what charges your battery, what drains your battery. Um, and that can be take a little bit of time to figure out. Um, look after well-being. There's some lovely information out there, the you know, five steps to well-being. Having a balanced day, getting enough sleep, looking after ourselves, getting enough exercise, having a good diet can be hugely helpful. Connecting with other people and what they say, noticing. So even if it's just breathing into your body or just noticing things around yourself. Sometimes people take photographs when they're out for a walk just to notice something that they saw on their walk. Avoid things like sugary foods and drinks, caffeine, alcohol, and smoking. Because these are often the things we run to when we're anxious, but these can actually make us more anxious. Um, the, how they're so other things I suppose that are really helpful is learning how anxiety feels in our body learn more about anxiety learn how it feels in your body deep breathing is really helpful that um, works on that vagal nerve the deep breathing and helps to bring down anxiety levels it helps to to calm that nervous system down deep belly breathing it can be difficult for some people I've found that the very people I feel need it can find it the most difficult to to get into so start slowly and practice when you're calm that would be the secret and there's things like Fitbits that can help us look after our well-being and kind of monitor things like heart rate and stuff and there are thinking strategies. There are therapists who work in this area who would be working on your thinking strategies, but just a very simple idea like this one. And Sharon, it's one of your visuals that 15% versus 85% rule. 15% of anything maybe is in my control. It's my responsibility. 85% isn't. So it might even be jotting down, what can I control? What am I responsible for in life? And these are all the things in the 85% column I have no control, but no responsibility over. So sometimes it's little exercises like that that really ground us in what the worries are and how we can maybe kind of nip them in the bud if it's, it's worried thoughts. And I always think being kind to yourself is so important here because when we're anxious, we can often say, what is wrong with me? Why can't I manage? Everyone else seems to be able to do it. And here I am and I've got all this going on. But it's, it's, it, that's you. That's and that's them on the other hand. Be kind to yourself. It's not a weakness. And it might actually be telling you that something needs to change in your life. Maybe you need to share some burden. Maybe you need to let go of some burden or maybe you need a bit of help. You, you've a lot on your plate. Your body is telling you maybe that something needs to change. So that's that's kind of what I think um, we need to be kind to ourselves. So getting more help, a great first step is talking to your GP. Some people need medic to help them. Um, there are professionals there, as I said, who would be able to give you coping strategies, psychologists, counsellors, psychotherapists, people who are really trained in the area and um, people who can tell, help with trauma and specialists who treat more serious cases. So there is help out there. Um, what I found really good was even a HSE had put the stress control and dot org they put their um workshops online and it was really good they're worth looking up so here we have some um of resources there's there's sharon's facebook and her detail and my contact details sharon's contact details some references luke bearden for the autism, he's, he's really good to look at. Um, there's a great book on panic attacks by Dr. Anya Tuberty, um, information from the HSE, there's the stress control course and some information on post-traumatic stress disorder. So Sharon, did you want to say anything to finish? 
Um, I just suppose uh, thanks to everybody for your attention and whatever. Make sure to check out the podcasts because there is a huge amount of information there and there's definitely something for everybody. There's from family members to um, to teachers, to, to parents, to uh, people, professionals working in the field. Um, I've been lucky enough to speak with uh, not like with autistic young people and autistic adults locally, bloggers, parents, um, authors, right up to world leaders in the autism uh, field of research and so on so there's a lot of information there and it's definitely a resource that is very very that people have found very very helpful it's also free and oftentimes people feel like they have to spend a lot of money to get a lot of information whereas this is a great free resource for anybody should anybody want to check it out but I suppose thanks again and I suppose Michaela you'd agree if anybody has any questions you're more than welcome to ask um, and if not we'll yeah. hand you over to Carol yeah yeah, thank you. Any questions, guys? I've posted online the different information on the chat, you know, your, your cloud system and all that so people Perfect. can access to it, okay? Perfect, thank you. Brilliant, thanks a million, guys. That was just absolutely okay. amazing. Um, I know we've, yeah. Uh, you know, there's just one person just raised their hand. I'm not sure how, what that means. Or does I that mean something? Me. I'd like to talk, but I don't see who it is. It was Laurie. Hi, was it? it's, hi, it's Joan here. Hi, Joan. Hi, Sharon and Michaela, thank you. That was really interesting. I work as an adult guidance counsellor and I'm just wondering, um, have you come across like a respectful and person-centred, you know, profiling tool that we could use with potential learners coming in, you know, so that we can help to get a really good, I suppose, sense of the person and like that the support that they might need you know whether there's particular sensory issues do you know and that that information could be given to the tutor you know just really to make that transition into our classes you know as smooth and as supportive as possible that's a really so Michaela, good question. I leave you go first oh, thanks. Go first. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question um I'm sure there are things out there I don't have a, an answer to it right away but I do think maybe just a questionnaire that you'd even devise yourself that you could actually ask people or go through with them mm -hmm. because I've learned so much from people just themselves. So just about their sensory, yeah. um, about their preferred, you know, their, their ways of learning. I mean, they'll, they'll have reports and things coming with them, some people, but sometimes just having those kind of questions that you just ask people themselves, yeah. there definitely yeah. would be yeah. tools out there. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose, Joan, there is, um, there's a woman called Winnie Dunn. Um, now you do, like it is OT led, it's around that kind of sensory processing profile and so on. Winnie Dunn is her name. Um, her questionnaires and kind of checklists are freely available online but you do need a professional kind of an OT or whatever to or somebody who is expert in uh, sensory integration therapies to be able to add them up properly but even yeah. looking at that as a as, as a guideline uh, yeah. around yeah. looking at that kind of sensory profile the other thing that I do have is at the moment on my own website I do have a thing called a communication passport now it's it's uh, it's specifically for small people for for younger children and so on because we would encourage that that parents and teachers would collaborate on communication passports and share information about the child around their strengths their 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 yeah. challenges around what their likes and dislikes are you could check that out and see is there any way that you could um you could incorporate some of those kind of questions into a kind of a self-devised uh, communication passport yourself that might be of some help around structuring up your own one as well fantastic great ideas thanks a million no problem thanks Great, John. Thank you very much. Brilliant question. In fact, I think it'll, it'll go a long way. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Any other hands up, Fred? No? Everybody's so far so good. So far, so okay, so thanks a million to, to you guys. I know we've gone over time again, but I think what you had to say was really, really important. Um, I'm going to take about 10, 12 minutes to say what I have to say, but I think it does wrap up quite well, you know, some of the stuff that you've been talking about and some of the stuff in the chat. Can I just put one tiny thought out there for a moment? Um, and it's it's come to me in the organizing of all of this and in the feedback and the conversations, trying to get people to come and present, et cetera. And that is, we're doing an awful lot in these four Fridays for our learners. Um, 
but we also need to do a good lot for our teachers and anxiety is something that hits absolutely every single one of us there are people who say to me god carol you're a powerhouse god carol you you weren't phased last week because we started this thing and everyone could see and hear you you know i can stand on the stage of the opera house in cork and i can talk it doesn't phase me but there are things that make me anxious there are things that make me quite nervous um and interestingly, I, I've had conversations, you know, we, we talk about dyslexia, dyspraxia, all of these labels for people. Now, I'm not dyslexic, but I am a shocking speller. I really am really bad at spelling. And it causes anxiety if you have to do stuff. I was talking to a colleague of mine uh, recently and he was saying, yes, it's the same for him when he goes into any presentation and he's the he's an attendee and there's a flip chart there. And if he thinks somebody's going to say, look it up and write something on the flip chart when you can't spell, it affects you hugely. Um, so I, I'm what I'm planning is that somewhere in the end of January or start of February, we'll have another one Friday or two Fridays, but it'll be centered around the teachers and the uh, managerial people even um, more so than just the students. So I hope you'll bear with me. I, I'll say what I have to say on mental health and our learners as fast as I can. This is not a COVID presentation. Is that fair enough? Um, and, and I'll just try and go as fast as Carol can go. And by God, she can go fast. Um, okay, go to my way, little pictures. Thank you. All right, so here we are. So I don't need to introduce myself. This is about mental health and well-being. It's about our learners and it is about um, what is it? What is this mental health thing? What is it that causes people to have mental health and in inverted commas or mental health issues? And to what extent, or I want to raise awareness about the extent to which some of these um, bad coping strategies, some of this lack of resilience is not the fault of the person that is showing this, um, these behaviors. So in the Cork ETB, we, um, or oh, sorry, I'll start with the Cork, uh, the green ribbon. Some of you might be aware of the green ribbon campaign, some of you might not. Um, sea change, I've written it down the bottom of the uh, screen there. You can Google sea change if you want to know about it. They're an organization um, who promote this green ribbon here that you see on the diagram, the same as we have the pink ribbon to support cancer campaigns, our cancer um, uh, awareness and all of that. Their idea in sea change is that they want people to wear the green ribbon and they want people to start talking about mental health issues and they want to start reducing the stigma attached to it because it's lovely to have these labels and say, yes, I can go to the disability officer and I can get resource for whatever my label is, but it's not so lovely to have a label in other scenarios and other systems and situations. And sometimes the label can cripple somebody. So in the Cork ETB, since around the end of the summer, we have this thing called Work Vivo. So it's, it's a bit like uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and all of that for anyone who doesn't know about it. But what it's doing for us is it's allowing us see what all the other people in our, we're, we're the second largest county in the country with 31,000 learners, we're huge. Um, it's allowing us see what other uh, parts of our organization are doing. And I have to give credit to the national schools, the secondary schools and youth reach centers in particular, because I've seen a good few clips up on Work Vivo showing that they're already involved in this Green Ribbon campaign. So we are doing this. We're going to roll this out as a, as an, a whole organizational um, program going forward. So realistically there's been people talking in the chat and talking verbally about the guidance counselors if we talk about our access and inclusion teams which involve disability officers learning support coordinators and um, anybody in sundry uh, learning uh, and i won't even list them all out any further we don't always mention the guidance counselors and the guidance counselors are what the one people at the cliff face looking after the mental health issues they're looking after the really serious stuff yes me as a teacher of further ed for over 30 years of my life and and a teacher of psychology i had a huge amount of stuff brought to me but jeepers there were some things and even with my experience and and my bravery if you like 
there was plenty of days where I was very glad I could walk along a corridor and bring somebody over to the guidance counselors because they were far more qualified and experienced at dealing with things. So I was talking to a few guidance counselors recently on uh, various different levels of authority within the Cork ETB, but the vast majority would agree that their job is broken down into three particular areas. Um, yes, they give us all sorts of advice about the courses that people can do when they go on to the next level, whatever that is. Yes, they do a good bit of coaching, but they have an ever increasing amount of counselling to do. And it's not just counselling because somebody's goldfish has died. It's counselling about real hardcore difficult issues. So when I took up my role as Active Inclusion Officer with the Cork E2B, I was aware that while that the year or two before that, when we were working as um, uh, champions of disability, that there was a 12.5% increase in mental health matters and issues within further ed colleges. I was only, a you know, that was my huge body of knowledge at the time. So one of the things I did was sent out a questionnaire to the, the principals of the further ed colleges. I was really interested in disability statistics primarily because I was giving a presentation for a head in May and I needed these statistics for that. So, um, and I wanted to carry on the work that the Active Inclusion Network had started with the pilot program with the head anyway, but, I snuck in a question into that questionnaire for the guidance counsellors and I listed out a couple of the issues that people would go into a guidance counsellor for as in counselling issues now. So there was suicidal ideation, there was self-harm, there was schizophrenia, there was depression, there was relationship issues, etc. And I didn't ask people, I asked them to rank order them. There was about eight or ten of them. I didn't ask them to tell, rank order them in severity. I know that. Um, I wanted the, to rank order them for frequency. I wanted to know what were the items that came in the door most often to them. So they said that in for, and these debates started way back in March. I was still getting phone calls and emails from people in June from guidance people about this. So the most common thing that comes through the door in further ed, I have found out, are financial issues and the domino effects of this. So whether that is they've no electricity, they've no food, they have, uh, you know, they're homeless, etc. These are financial issues are the most common thing that come through the door. Relationship issues were the second and boundary issues with that. So there was some semblance of abuse and domestic abuse issues in, in that one and gender issues. Gender, gender issues were way up there in the factors in further ed that the guidance counsellors would have to counsel people with. And the gender issues were particularly with the youngsters, the school leavers that were coming in. Now, not for one second am I trying to diminish the significance of um, suicidal ideation and self-harm and schizophrenia and bipolar depression and everything else that, that, that um, they have to deal with. And I just want to acknowledge or remind us all that of, and some people who may not um, know perhaps um, that all of these counselors have mandatory supervision sessions. So it is acknowledged that the stuff that they deal with can cause a huge strain to them and that they need to offload this stuff in a safe space for them, just like the learners that came into them had to offload their stuff in a safe place with the guidance counsellor. So moving on swiftly, the Cork to be the numbers last year were 31,000 learners. Um, it's made up of, we start with the, um, the level one and two or no accreditation courses at all, which would be CTCs. These are community training centres. And we'd have nearly 5,000 of those learners last year. Then we go to levels one, two, three and four in youth reach centres are back to education. Our national schools and our secondary schools uh, range from levels one to five. Our FET centres, our, our further ed colleges, I should say, we had about 5,000 of those. They're usually level five and six. And our new apprenticeship courses um, can bring us right up to level nine on the national framework. I've coloured these differently. And I've done that because of guidance facilities and guidance resource. On the green levels down the bottom here, which represents about 19,000 learners, um, now, some of our BTI people in here might have their classes in further ed colleges, and if so, they can avail of the further ed facilities, but a lot of them don't. 
So we're talking 10 to 12,000 learners here in the white area have a very different conditions to the green area. So the green levels have on-campus counsellors. They have guidance counsellors on campus all of the time. They might even have two or three of them. They, and in some of the colleges and centres, <coughs> excuse me, they have guidance people who do the, the triad of work that I was talking about, but they also have other teachers who, like myself, have loads of other qualifications over the years who've gone into counselling and done some counselling and they're doing some extra counselling classes. We, we uh, have extra excuse me, external counsellors that come in and work in the further ed colleges. However, our level one, two, three and four up here are people with no accredited courses at all, have very few counselling services. They share them. Quite often, one counsellor is shared between five or six centres. And um, so we have six guidance counsellors covering these two white layers here. And we have two information officers covering those. And what we need to do is increase all of that. So I want to take a look now at some of the issues that can be uh, in the minds and the lives of some of our further ed learners, our FET learners, if you like, or even our national school and secondary school learners, in fairness. So financial issues would be one, having cold or run down homes with no guarantee of a regular meal having low education levels from their family. It's very often with students coming in to um, centres where they say, I'm the first person to, you know, do, to go on with my education or finish my education, et cetera. You can't assume in, with some of our learners that they can read or write, and you certainly can't assume that their parents at home can read or write. They could have household members with depression or other mental health issues, household members who are involved in sus substance abuse, alcoholics, or people in prison. And neglect can be a very big issue, emotional neglect and phys physical neglect or other forms of abuse, with, and we know what they are. A lot of them don't have an advocate at home to, to push them to succeed. They might have somebody that says, oh, you know, stay home today and mind the young ones, stay home today and go and do shopping for me. They're not necessarily pushing them out to get the education, and then the education is going to help them go forward and, and, and um, mix in community. So bad experiences with education before now and self-esteem will be low and self-efficacy will be low. So I, I, from personal experience of further ed, I have met all of these factors. I have certainly, I can't say I've met them all in one person, but certainly in pretty much every one of my classes, there's somebody that will tick some of those. However, if you remember my slide earlier on with the green lines and the white lines, if you go into the back to education section, into the youth reach section and into the community training centers, you will find an awful lot more learners in these centers that can tick several of these items all by themselves. And you don't need it to just be in the one class. So, these things, these items that I referred to, like emotional neglect, household member in jail, witnessing violence against a parent, parental divorce or separation, all of these, they're called ACEs. And in research, they're called ACEs. They're, ACEs refers to adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences will affect your health. Adverse childhood experience. I went to a lecture in the Western Gateway Building in ECC about three years ago, I think, and it said, or uh, we were told there that if you have three of these things going on for you in your life, the chances of you having an autoimmune disease when you grow into adulthood is far, far higher. They were a Scottish group that came over to give a presentation and they were working in a ghetto school somewhere in Scotland, I can't remember, and they put one initiative to go, they put several together, but they, they started just standing at the door of their ghetto school and as the kids came in, it was a secondary school, as the kids came in in the morning, they would say, hello, John, or in Scotland it would be you, and hello, Mary, hello, whoever you are. They made sure that they identified each learner by name. Um, they also did other sorts of interventions, but they found even just doing that one, giving these people an identity, making them see that they were seen, helped these youngsters and they were attending more, they were 
getting better results in their homework, they were paying attention better in class, behavioural issues that just some people spoke about earlier were not so prevalent. So more research on ACEs can show that 67% of the population have at least one of these things. Um, all of us have experienced some one or more of these, whether it's not in our own family, in the families next door or our friends or our neighbours. If you have more than three of these ACEs, then you're three times more likely to have lung cancer um, uh, as an adult. You're 11 times more likely to use drugs, intravenous drugs, 14 times more likely to be suicidal or attempt suicide, four times more likely to have had sex before the age of 15, four and a half times more likely to develop depression, and twice as likely to have liver damage. What the research also shows, and I have given uh, Farad there a list of links um, that, that support all of the stuff I'm saying, and we'll supply them to everybody. Um, what the research also says is that if these ACEs, if these characteristics in your life happen, before you hit puberty. So before brain pruning happens, before your brain turns into an adult brain, because the child's brain is quite different. If all of this happens before then, then the chances of you being resilient by being able to bounce back from things are fairly slim. Um, it, the chances, and if your resilience isn't there, your coping strategies are not there. The chances of you learning coping strategies are going to be very, very slim unless somebody really spends spend some time to train you and help you to do this. In other words, people who and the, the youngsters and the adults who had this kind of um, environment when they were young, which we very often see in FET centres, particularly in the lower levels where they need a very, very gentle introduction into coming in for just one morning, coming in maybe for two mornings, coming for one day a week, et cetera, et cetera, until they build up to come to the further ed colleges, if they're able for that, these people need huge support. And it's not that they can shake it off and just get on with it and be more resilient and do things. They just can't do that. They need huge support. They need huge training. They need huge uh, changes in experiences and expectations for what's going to happen in order to develop really good coping skills. So and we acknowledge, and as I said before, we all suffer with stuff. We have all have baggage. So unfortunately, some people have a lot more than others. Um, so on that note, what we've decided, John Fitzgibbons and myself, is that we're going to put to the executive this notion of having a phone line and an online service where we will have counsellors, not guidance people who are telling about courses, not guidance people who are telling us about coaching, but people who are just there for counselling. Um, and particularly we want them on a phone because we're thinking of the, the first and foremost to look after the centres that were coloured white earlier on. And these people are most likely going to contact people by phone before they would use the Zoom and the Teams and all that carry on. So um, we want these counsellors to be able to operate on both. We want to be able to pick up your smartphone and, says so she picking up too, um, pick up your phone and, and be able to use that and have face-to-face -face stuff if they're able for that, if they have the technology for that. But what we want our counsellors, the issue that we have in bringing it and, and deciding on it is do we staff this by people within our organization, as I said, might be other guidance people or people employed as teachers who've got counseling qualifications, but they're not employed as guidance people um, uh, per se. Do we do, you do that or do we source it um, from an outside company? So that, that's a decision above and beyond my head. I can make the recommendations, but I can't make the decision. So. Um, what I wanted to do here was my intention here was to raise your awareness about ACEs and how sometimes the resilience and the coping strategies that seem to be uh, in huge demand and, and, and pay, taking a lot of our attention, um, regardless of any COVID situations, it has nothing to do with the person, as in they're not responsible for it. It's not their fault. Um, having a little bit of knowledge 
hopefully will help an awful lot more compassion happen and hopefully will improve our inclusion. So I'll leave you with the thought for today about it being the company that we're with is what's important more so than any journey or any destination that we're going to, but being in good company. And um, on that note as well, I will remind you, I have video clips and links um, there, which will tell you about anything in my presentation. I have stuff about polyvagal theory as well, and I have stuff about anxiety. Um, and you can have all of those. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And if anyone has um, <coughs> anything to say. Carol, just so that you know, I shared the link that you sent me this morning so for them on the chat so people can copy them and paste them or, or go to it straight away, okay? Brilliant, thanks for that. No, David, I haven't. Um, I, I know another girl with a similar name who's a teacher in another area, of course, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think the phone line will be great. Um, I just wish I could get these things to happen really, really quickly. You know, we're a huge organization and, and getting things up can, can sometimes take time. Yeah, I don't think there's there's too many questions. Thank you, everybody. And um, we're, as I say, we're recording this, and there's several people who've said they can't be here for um, supervision reasons, etc. Um, so hopefully they'll listen to that, and we'll have some more feedback afterwards. And as I say, I just to see the thought. I hope we will get to the point where, um, in January or February, we can have some sessions about staff. Thanks, Angela. That's great to hear. You're all very welcome. So thank you very much for attending. I'm going to stay here and I will be the last one that leaves the room. Um, thanks a million. I hope you'll come again next week. We have a whole huge array of people talking to you from further ed, um, from the prison system, from outdoor education, from um the training center from youth reach uh, just and we have two students lined up to talk to you as well thanks a million to our panelists today and all the work you put in and all the patience you had with the doing and the flowing and the timing and the this and the that um and a very special thank you to my right hand man there um for that because i would be lost without him cheers guys thank you and have a, good, have a lovely weekend i hope you enjoyed the toy show Oh, Everybody. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for it. You're welcome, Trevor. Bye bye. Yeah, cool. Have a good one. Bye, Michaela. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fred. And thanks, Carl. Thanks, Sharon. Sharon. Bye bye. Thank you for being here. Bye, Lucy. I think you're on, on mute. Yeah. I'm muted. Thanks a million, guys. Thank bye, you so much. Lucy, love. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Cool. Okay. We're down to there's nine people still with us. It is just you and me, Farad. <laughs> That's right. Just you and me, boy. Just sit down to the old reliables again. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Hello, Helen Carey. I didn't see Helen's name earlier. Do you want to stop the recording or? That is a very good idea, my friend, yes.